are. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes. So um, if you, you might have already seen um, attendees, you're welcome to post uh, any messages in the chat. But if you have questions for the panel um, that we will, we, in, the, in the last part of the webinar, we'll, we'll do more of a Q&A and discussion. You can put those into the Q&A function that you see here on Zoom uh, at the bottom. Uh, so with that, I will introduce uh, today's host, um, Ms. Doris Akko. Uh, she is um, a very distinguished um, uh, person here. She has over 20 years of experience in tax administration, uh, working both in the public and the private sector. She is the former Commissioner General of the Uganda Revenue Authority and was also a member of the Council of the At um, African Tax Administration Forum. And she's now working with the ICTD as a senior policy uh, uh, an engagement advisor, and she is the one who uh, initiated holding this event today. So with that, I'll pass it off to Doris. Thank you very much, Rhiannon, and a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever it is you're joining. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We are hosting this webinar in commemoration of the International Women's Day or International Women's Month 2021. And we are focusing really on conversations in tax that have impact on women, uh, research, focusing on research and policy that is done on Africa. Why is it important for us to have these conversations? Would like to provide a platform for the women who are involved in holding this tax research to share their expertise and what it is they have found on the pertinent issues um, as around women and tax. We'd also like to have a conversation about different perspectives regarding gender and taxation, especially in Africa. But most importantly, we'd like to put also a focus on something that is not really talked about as much, the involvement of women in tax policy and tax administration. By the end of the webinar, we should be able to have answers to the question on how explicit biases in tax can be rectified, also how we can facilitate the involvement uh, of women uh, in their representation in tax policy debates, tax administration, and tax research. You may have heard about the concept of gender equality and taxation. This has been talked about for a while now, and it is one of the issues that is quite key in the development policy debate uh, in relation to public finance or fi financing for development, but also in the debate around the responsibility that governments have um, to their citizens. Uh, in the context of the SGD5, um, achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women, it is important for us to understand what are the underlying issues, what are the pertinent issues surrounding gender equality and taxation. I think by the end of this, uh, it would be fair to say that um, mainstreaming gender equality uh, into general tax policy analysis can significantly improve the quality of public policy. And why is this important? Because um, promoting sustainable economic growth and poverty reduction it is important that policy interventions in the area of taxation do not negatively impact uh, desired outcomes for gender equality. So for those who are coming into this discussion for the first time, what are some of the issues? What is the nexus between gender and equality? And these are the conversations we'll be having uh, this morning. Biases in the tax system. Gender biases can be explicit or implicit, explicit if they are arising from direct provisions in the law or implicit, these are less obvious and they may relate to how the tax system affects men and women, uh, their well-being. Employment and labor, pers labor perspectives. You may find that the tax policy or the way the tax system is designed may have a bearing on how women and their income and this may influence their economic welfare, their childbearing uh, behavior, but also their participation in the labor market. From a personal income tax perspective, you find that differentials in income um, levels between men and women 
may result in women who are generally lower income earners being taxed effectively at a marginal, a higher marginal tax rate than men. Indirect taxes, and here we focus mainly on VAT. VAT can exert a gender bias on women because of women's consumption patterns. Uh, there is a potential for women to bear a larger VAT burden if the VAT system does not provide for exemptions or reduced uh, rates on the, on the consumption um, items that women are usually buy more than men. Tax policy design. The way a tax system is designed or the way governments raise revenue may also have a different impact on men and women. The same applies to how um, high free tax-free allowances for small businesses may affect women uh, and men differently. So a tax policy design that fo fo focuses on increasing indirect taxes instead of increasing direct taxes could potentially be more burdensome mm -hmm. for women. Informal taxation, and this is outside of the formal tax field, women face a higher fiscal burden to access public goods and services. And the research will be, um, uh, uh, we will hear some research findings on this. On tax transparency, it is considered, uh, tax is considered a technical um, subject and not many women are involved in the discussions of tax at the international level, international tax level. In tax administration, I think now it, studies have shown that women are very good tax administrators. We'll also be listening to how we can encourage more women to be involved in tax policy design, but also in tax administration. So these are some of the um, linkages that we will be discussing this morning between gender and tax. And who better to discuss these than the distinguished panel of women in tax, talking about how the various taxation issues I've mentioned and more affect women, especially in Africa. This morning, we will be listening to Joy Warukurun Dubai. Joy is a doctoral candidate and a teaching and research associate at the Vienna Global Tax Policy Center, Institute of Austrian and International Tax Law. She has researched extensively on international tax rules and the place that African countries need to take in negotiations of these international tax rules. We'll be listening to Dr. Julia Mascani. Dr. Julia is the research director at ICTD. She's a research fellow in the governance cluster at the Institute of Development Studies, as well as a research associate at the Institute of Fiscal Studies in the UK. Her main research interests relate to taxation, public finance, and the evaluation of public policy in low-income countries. Uh, she's an economist and she obtained her PhD in 2014 at the University of Sussex Department of Economics. We'll also be listening to Mrs. Mary Baine. Mrs. Mary Baine is the Director of Tax Programs at the African Tax Administration Forum. Uh, Mary has uh, led a lot of capacity building um, missions, focusing mainly on mobilizing greater domestic revenue through improved efficiency and effectiveness in tax administration. Um, Mary is the former Commissioner General at Rwanda Revenue Authority, and she also served as the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the government of Rwanda. Dr. Jalia Kangave is currently the lead consultant for tax and gender uh, taxation program at the ICTD. Jalia has over 10 years of experience in the field of taxation and law and development, and she's worked in academia, in the private sector, in government, as well as in the civil society uh, sector uh, in Uganda, but also internationally. Dr. Jalia holds a PhD in law from the University of British Columbia. This is the distinguished panel that will be discussing the issues that are um, we are going to listen to today. So to start us off, I will ask Joy. Joy, what do you think? What is your perspective about the international tax policy and gender uh, debate? What would you like us to, to know over to you? 
Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I prepared some, I don't know if uh, we could have them put up. Okay. As the slides uh, are coming up, uh, Joy, as the slides are coming up, we'll just invite the audience, the attendees to participate in a poll. And we'll be asking you a question before we listen to the presentations, uh, just to get your perspectives. Do you think African tax systems have biases against women? I uh, will run the poll. Are African tax systems biased against women? You could say either yes or no, or maybe you're not sure. We'll look at the results and then test your um, views again at the end of the webinar. So we're taking the poll now. As soon as we have the results for the poll, maybe we can put them up. Thank you very much. 58% of you believe that African tax systems are biased against women, 11% say no, and 32% are not sure. We'll test um, your perspectives again at the end of the session uh, to see whether listening to the presentations has changed your mind. So over to you, Joy. Uh, uh, you can you. tell us what you think about the international tax rules. Thank you. Good morning, everyone from uh, Vienna. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're based. Um, so I've been asked to speak about the impact that international tax policy can have on gender inequality. And this is often a not so straightforward discussion because of two reasons. One, international tax issues can seem very distant from the ordinary citizen. And two, international tax policy is very fragmented and it's also very complex which makes it even more difficult to bring it down to the ordinary level and try to understand the impact it can have at the national level. Despite this, um, I will try to guide some thinking about the objectives of tax systems and how that fits into um, how we desire to deal with social welfare and therefore uh, gender inequality issues, um, the revenue collection needs for financing gender responsive public services, and why we need to view the fiscal system as a whole, rather than taking the siloed approach of picking up one tax and focusing on it. Uh, so I will just ask you to move to the next slide. Thank you. So why is, uh, as, we, as the slide changes, <laughs> why is gender inequality a concern for tax policy? First and rather clearly, women and men face different socioeconomic realities. And that means that tax systems will affect them in different ways. Uh, and this is a very important statement and I'll come back to it at the very end. And I hope it will be very clear why we have this discussion altogether. So what kind of disadvantages do women face uh, disproportionately that are ex especially relevant to tax? So first of all, the income and wealth gaps uh, are, differ. Women are less likely to have uh, capital income, own land, property, and other assets, including companies, and they're also not often financial investors. The way that women establish entrepreneurship differs, and this quite strongly links to their dominance in the informal sector. Uh, labor participation differs. It's not only driven by cultural beliefs or practices, but also economic structures, the division of labor in the home, which makes direct reference to unpaid care work obligations, which are not economically valued. Um, there's unequal power relations at work in society and in politics, and this has had a great influence on the ability of women to participate in highly technical fields and the visibility in the space. So from a tax perspective, this is very much a concern, especially for African women and other women of color and their representation, especially at the international tax level. So we do need to understand how tax policies interact with these disadvantages. And really the big question is, um, why do they matter? And when we're asking why they matter, uh, does it have the effect of eliminating these disadvantages or does it perpetuate them? And can tax policy directly resolve some of these issues? Um, to answer this question from the perspective of international tax, you have to, first of all, even deal with the question of what is international tax policy? Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, international tax policy is made up of hard and soft laws, and that's the bilateral tax treaties negotiated between countries, the domestic tax laws that deal with cross-border taxation issues, uh, multilateral cooperation and coercion. And beyond that, we have the international trade law that deals with tariffs. And increasingly, we're now seeing that investment and trade um, obligations are starting to deal with certain tax measures. So we've seen more disputes arising in these two spaces which means that there's an element of tax policy that can be dealt with in other spaces beyond what we traditionally view as tax policy. And this is a problem for meeting key objectives uh, for a national fiscal system. First of all, when you're trying to meet the objective of fairness, it means that there's lacking harmony and the fragmentation of system frustrates um, fairness in particular. And I'll try to explain this uh, in a rather fast way uh, as we don't have too much time. Um, Although we've all committed to addressing uh, gender inequality, international tax policy is only beginning to acknowledge what this means and how we need to approach this. So there's some interesting uh, studies that have mainly been done uh, by the EU Commission, uh, 2017 one that I think had very interesting findings about how we need to redirect our thinking about gender inequality and what it means as a whole for the entire system. So how do tax policies at the international level affect or perpetuate gender inequality? Uh, and I will just take us back a little bit uh, to the last 30 years, the dominant economic rationale has been dealing with market efficiency or achieving market efficiency. Uh, this is facilitating free movement, free trade and encouraging foreign direct investment. Because of this and the nature of globalization, uh, countries quickly realized that their national tax systems had begun to have international or cross-border implications mainly that their tax systems could affect the investment decisions as countries became increasingly competitive in the types of systems they were providing, uh, the benefits they were providing to companies in order to attract them. So to some extent, this led to the lowering of tax rates um, and the broadening of bases. So focusing particularly on corporate income tax. Uh, despite having progressive systems, over time, this has meant that overall progressivity of tax system has, has decreased. And there's been an increased reliance on labor income and other low mobility factors with lesser emphasis on wealth taxes. Now, <laughs> increasing competition has then led to deprioritization of the key objectives of tax systems. So tax systems have three or four key objectives that should be met, um, certainty, simplicity, fairness, uh, <laughs> and efficiency. And I, I'm just getting, I'm going to speed up a little bit and skip a few things. Um, so if, if, if the current nature of the systems uh, with where competition stands is the focus has mainly been on efficiency, uh, fairness and, and simplicity have been deprioritized over time. So we have a number of things happening. Lower rates, burden bases, uh, which have only worked for a limited time and a limited number of countries. And now they're no longer working for everyone. Uh, the limited solutions provided at the multilateral level are not exactly working, they're complex and they don't deal with the entire issue. So the result has been uh, the quote from the IMF spillover reports in 2014, which is that spillovers are affecting the macroeconomic performance of countries at the broader level and distribution of welfare across countries. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what is the compounded effect? Uh, so we're, talking, we're looking at lower rates, broadened bases, an increase in fiscal threats. When I say fiscal threats, I mean avoidance, evasion, corruption, money laundering, and so on. So we must view the tax policy system rather broadly because it has to be able to deal with all the fiscal threats that are um, that can happen externally and internally and have international implications. High informality, a low capacity for administration, and this has meant much lower uh, tax revenue collection. Just look at the average tax to GDP rates across the African continent, compare them to OECD countries. Now, accompany this with more taxes on low mobility factors, it means the compounded effect is very significant. And not only is there insufficient revenue to invest in public services, there's also more taxation on domestic low mobility factors. What does this mean for fairness and how should it be resolved? There's a few factors I think are important if, if you're trying to resolve this and governments need to think about this rather significantly. We cannot pinpoint uh, singular taxes on their own. You have to look at the entire system and how it works together. That's because uh, some tax problems might be resolved by other elements of the fiscal system. It's, desire, it's good to look at the most desirable means of revenue collection and should prioritize fairness 
when thinking about this uh, and look at the expenditure priorities as well. As I've said, gender responsive public services are extremely important. We need to understand tax competition. Why do we engage in tax competition? And does it, do we gain any benefit from engaging in tax competition and the resulting spillover effects? We need a system in harmony. Are we meeting the revenue needs, especially given the impact of COVID-19? We focus so much on sustainable financing. We now need to answer the question about domestic resource mobilization from every perspective, not just the domestic obligations, but the international obligations as well. Um, how do we protect our fiscal systems? Next slide, please. Fiscal systems, fiscal threats need to be addressed rather strongly, and there needs to be a strong commitment, both from policymakers and administrators. We need a shifting of objectives from efficiency back to fairness and simplicity. As I mentioned, we have an overly complex international tax system. If we can focus on these two features, we might be able to go back towards, are we raising sufficient revenue? And are we investing that revenue in gender responsive public services? I've tried to address some of these issues on the slide here, but just to close off, I will say that um, what's the question we should ask when we talk about international tax policy? And how do we resolve? So how do we resolve the underlying advantages that women are facing? Can tax policy do that? No, unless there's explicit biases dealt with, not really and not directly. And research shows that it cannot be done directly. So what does tax policy mean? Why does it matter? It's the ability to raise revenue fairly. And that's the sustainable financing perspective. And this can only be harmonized within a system responding to fiscal threats effectively and investing in effective quality, gender responsive public services. I will close off there and thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, I think you've uh, given us a snapshot of the, the linkages between international tax policy and the gender taxation debate. I think one of the things that you've mentioned is that the international tax system is very complicated. That means that there's not that much intervention, um, that much representation, not only by African countries, but specifically by women in those discussions. And that kind of puts the issues of gender and taxation to the back burner. But also one of the things that you've mentioned that because of the tax threats, the fiscal threats to the tax system, um, the, the, the result of that is that perhaps less revenue is being collected. And that means that there's less money available for spending on public services, public goods that many women would benefit from. I'd like to, to ask Dr. Julia, if the tax system is very complex at the international level, how can it be made more, um, how can it made more, you know, less complicated for women, for uh, African countries, African policymakers, and how can we intervene in making this system more responsive to the needs on the African continent? And here I also bring in the issues of confusion, even at the national level, about what tax, re tax responsibilities are about, and not only at the international level. So Dr. Julia, uh, tell us what you think about these issues, please. Thank you very much, Doris, and thanks, Joy, for a, a great presentation uh, just, uh, just now. Um, so, I mean, absolutely, what I'm going to focus on today is this issue of complexity. And Joy talked about uh, how complexity is an issue at the international level. And uh, I'd like to bring this conversation to the domestic level in many ways. Um, so what does complexity look like, uh, you know, in the practice of many uh, countries in Africa? And in many ways, I'd like to do that because often when we think um, about tax compliance, we think about a mix of enforcement and promoting voluntary compliance. We as researchers often think like that. But we tend to forget that, uh, you know, there are common people on the other side. And, um, and what I hear from, from those people who might be, uh, you know, friends, family members, people in the community, oftentimes it's complaints about how complex it is, this tax system. Um, I see lots of confusion uh, about what the tax system really is and, and really weak knowledge about basic elements of it. Um, so what I'm going to try to do um, in the next eight to 10 minutes is uh, really to give you some numbers on this and uh, to discuss a little bit uh, the, the implications. So let me start with some numbers on taxpayer knowledge. So a few, uh, a couple of years ago, we collected some survey data in Rwanda, and this is data from uh, new taxpayers. And um, what we have uh, found there um, is really quite interesting results on how weak uh, knowledge is amongst, uh, amongst those taxpayers. So we had a tax quiz uh, with 20 questions about basic elements uh, about the tax system. 
And uh, in that quiz, we found this. Um, almost 40% of the people we interviewed did not know what tax type they register for. And they know they're registered in the tax system, but they are not quite sure what tax type. Um, and even looking at all the questions we asked, um, on average respondents, and we had 2000 of them, they got right less than six questions out of 20. So that is less than a third. So definitely knowledge about the tax system is quite, is quite weak. But then we might want to ask, you know, what are the implications? Uh, and I think they have a lot to do with two things that Joy mentioned, which are fairness and simplicity. So let me highlight uh, some of the implications. One, the first one is exactly about uh, fairness and equity. Um, so what we have seen in research is that um, small firms often experience higher tax burdens. And those higher tax burdens are associated with the inability of small firms to take up things in the tax system that would benefit them. So for example, um, in Ethiopia and in South Africa, we calculated effective tax rates and we found out that small corporations face a higher tax burden than larger corporations. And that is related to their inability to claim for deductions, which would lower their tax payments. And similarly, uh, more recently, we have done some work on the VAT uh, in Rwanda. And again, we have found a very similar result. So small firms actually face a larger tax burden than bigger firms. And why is that? Um, it is really related to their inability to claim refunds. Now, refunds in the tax system um, is, uh, in the VAT system, is actually a key component. And it means you can essentially offset your tax payments uh, by claiming back what you have paid on VATs on your inputs. Now we're talking about businesses. And if you don't do that, you end up paying more. And this is exactly what is happening among small uh, firms in, in Rwanda. Uh, so weak technology has real implications on equity. It also has uh, real implications on citizen state relations. So I think, again, as tax researchers, we always want to think that, you know, tax has this virtuous circle where if you pay tax, you would then start demanding from your government accountability, transparency over uh, how those revenues are spent. But how is that going to happen if citizens are not informed about the tax system? How is that going to happen if they are not aware of their status, of their rights, of their obligations. So of course it is really hard in that situation for them to engage in tax dialogue and for them to feel empowered to make those demands around accountability and transparency. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, another great woman in tax, Vanessa van den Bogard, uh, has done some uh, really interesting research exactly looking at those questions in Ghana and Sierra Leone. Uh, the final implication is, uh, um, has to do with the prevailing narrative uh, that we will uh, all heard about, that we need to formalize the informal sector, right? But I think what we don't ask enough is what happens after we have formalized those informal firms? So do they actually engage with the tax system? Are they able to meet their tax obligations? Do they feel enough confident enough to navigate the tax system? And again, I'm going to go back to some numbers. So when we collected those data from new taxpayers in Rwanda, we found that over 50% of new taxpayers don't uh, submit declarations in the first year after they're registered. And if they don't do that in the first year, it is very unlikely that they will ever do that later. So these are non-filers. Then there is a large proportion of taxpayers who file what we call nil declarations. So they file a declaration, but they report zero everywhere. And if they report zero everywhere, they have basically, they give no information to the revenue authority and they of course pay no tax. So these are nil filers. So once we put together non filers and nil filers, they actually represent the majority of taxpayers who are registered in the tax registry of many revenue authorities. And they are totally unproductive taxpayers. They don't pay tax and they don't um, uh, provide that information. And that to me, tell me tells me something about the effectiveness of that strategy to really formalize in the informal sector. I think that's what happens next um, and, uh, and, uh, and are these, able, uh, these firms able to engage. Now the next question is what can the tax administration do about it? And Mary is going to discuss a lot more about this uh, um, in a second. There is a lot to be done about uh, taxpayer, about simplification, about reducing compliance costs, and uh, um, you know, revenue administrations in Africa have, have done a lot on this actually. Um, but there is also a lot that can be done on um, taxpayer education, and by that, by taxpayer education, I mean providing information in a clear way on the website, have a functioning call center. Um, and even provide 
training is helpful in addressing those problems. So taxpayers who go to the training, and it's only half a day training, uh, they see an increase in their knowledge by 40%. They see a significant increase in, their, in the probability that they will submit a declaration. And they are also much less likely to see the tax system as being complex. So there is, there is something that tax administrators can do, and they are already doing it. Tax administrators in Africa are very engaged in social media, radio, television. There's all sorts of things going on. So hopefully so far I have convinced you that uh, knowledge, complexity, and confusion are real issues, and there is something that tax administrators can do. But you might be uh, wondering, what does this have to do with women? And are there biases? You know, the poll we had at the beginning. So I think in this case, and actually many cases uh, around the tax system, the there is no explicit bias in the sense that the tax system is not really going after women specifically because they're women, but there are implicit biases. And, um, and again, let me give you some numbers. Uh, before this um, conversation, I went back to the data and I actually split our sample uh, between uh, women-headed uh, firms and male-headed firms. And I found two really interesting things. The first one is that um, tax knowledge is much lower amongst business women than it is amongst businessmen. And that is still true once I account for sector, location, and firm size. The second uh, result that I got is that uh, women are more represented uh, in the group of small firms. So when I look at, this, uh, at the smallest firms in Rwanda, I find a 50-50 split across the two genders. But when I look at the biggest firms, women represent less than a quarter of a firm. So they had less than a quarter of firms amongst those uh, larger firms. So I asked, um, he has very similar data from Eswatini, and he found exactly the same patterns. So knowledge is lower amongst business women, and women are more represented uh, in the, amongst the smallest firms than by a six. Small firms are particularly affected by this issue of weak knowledge, complexity, and many small firms are headed by women. There is no specific bias against women, but they happen to be very affected by those uh, issues. So uh, the tax system operates in a context of inequality, although it is not itself the cause of that inequality. So I think that begs the question um, on whether tax is then the right policy tool to address gender inequalities. So of course there are things that can be done, um, but probably it is not the main tool to address those inequalities. And when I think about the tax, uh, the fiscal system as a whole, looking at tax and spending, other policy tools might actually be better placed to tackle the barriers that women face to start and grow their businesses and even participate in the labor force. And these have to do with the availability of care services for children and, and, and the elderly, which often fall on uh, uh, women's shoulder, much more disproportionately than men. It has to do with safety in the workplace and in public places. And it has to do with participation in higher education. So it's not enough to have equality in primary and secondary education. We need to look at that, uh, at that participation in higher education as well. So some of those barriers are cultural, of course, but some of them need more revenue. And it is right to demand more revenue to fund services, for example, like universal um, childcare. Um, but I think it's important also to acknowledge that the link between more revenue and better outcomes for women is far from guaranteed. So more revenue is not actually going to do much for women unless policymakers who are in charge of making decisions on spending really make the fight uh, against gender inequality a really high priority. If that is not there, it's very unlikely that those additional revenues are going to translate in better outcomes. Now, I want to conclude on a positive note um, and, and, and addressing the question, you know, does it mean that the tax system cannot help women more? Of course not. There is a lot that uh, the tax system can be done for women. Can, can do for women. And um, thinking specifically about the issues that I talked about today around complexity, taxpayer education, tax knowledge, some revenue authorities have experimented, for example, with um, education programs specifically targeted at business women. And these are great. Um, I would imagine they are really useful and they are certainly to be encouraged. And there's also a lot that, the, uh, that can be done to make tax systems fairer in general, both in terms of formal taxes um, you know, I think there are still significant gaps in taxing the wealthy and taxing multinational corporations, um, as well as informal taxes. And this is something that uh, Jalia will be uh, talking about later. And making the tax system fairer will benefit everyone, including women. 
But certainly the fight for women equality doesn't stop with the tax system. Uh, there are certainly other battles to be fought uh, elsewhere in the fiscal system as a whole. So let me stop there uh, and pass it over to you again, Doris. Wow, excellent. Thank you very much, Julia. I think you've said a lot of things, a lot of things about the complexity, the tax systems. You've said a lot of things about how what polit policy tools can be used to uh, promote gender equality, realizing that tax is not the tool, perhaps not the only tool. And I think this gives us food for thought, uh, maybe areas for further research. What can policymakers do to, uh, you know, to, to, to use the tax system? What can policymakers do to use the tax system to promote uh, gender equality, but certainly to remove the barriers that women face in their day-to-day -day, uh, businesses? And um, maybe this is uh, something I can put to Mary. Mary has been involved in tax policy design. She's also been involved in tax administration. You've heard the numbers coming in from Julia, particularly relating to what, um, you know, what tax administrations are doing to improve uh, education and knowledge uh, of women in business to enable them to comply. Mary, what role do you think women can play? What, what can women bring to the table in ensuring that tax policy designs or the way tax administrations are run uh, help in removing the barriers that uh, Julia just mentioned? Over to you, Mary. Well, thank you so much, um, <clears throat> uh, Doris. And uh, it was really great listening to Julia and, uh, and Joy before her because uh, they're giving very, very good information about tax administration. And uh, they dealt actually with a more complex part and I'll deal with the softer things that women can do in terms of improving uh, tax policy and tax administration. And I think uh, we all know that the objective at the end of the day is uh, these revenues go to improve the livelihood of our citizenry. And so it is an area really that everybody has to invest in. So uh, is the role of women any different from their male counterparts in terms of tax policy and tax administration? Well, um, it shouldn't be really different, especially in terms of tax administration. But I think given the fact that women are already at a disadvantage, it is important to always um, uh, put this into focus. And it is always important to also consciously put in place uh, uh, policies that in a way and in the long run will advantage women and bring them into place. Secondly, I want to say that I'm a firm believer that different roles played in the design of, tax, of solid tax policy and administration and the resultant good is universal. So if well articulated, it would benefit everyone and eliminate the very obvious gender inequality that has been you know, mentioned by other speakers. Indeed, the gender variances specific tax collection have been acknowledged by many governments and resulting into legislative and policy changes to try and achieve the gender uh, equity in tax collection. Again, uh, as I discuss this, I will highlight the tax policy aspects and then I'll look at the administration. But more importantly, I will give my two pens on how I think the gender inequality should be addressed uh, as we go forward. So let's look at the tax policy. What is the reality on the ground? Indeed, as the previous speaker said, gender inequality or uh, empowerment is a recent development issue. Just as I actually, I was just <clears throat> reading somewhere that it's similar to tax because if you listen to any development plans these days, everybody refers to tax as being, you know, a key enabler. It is seen as the, you know, as what will have this. But let's see what is the role of women in developing this tax policy, and that is why nations have had to make conscious decisions to address this. So let me give an illustration to, uh, you know, to, uh, to make it clear. Governments have had to introduce gender neutral tax policy. Uh, and uh, I'll give an example of South Africa uh, that introduced or documented uh, a gender neutral policy as recent as 1995. Uh, this gives a single tax structure uh, that is imposed on individuals irrespective of gender or marital status. Presently, they are advanced in this regard, where their overall revenue authority workforce is at 62% female, according to the 2019 African tax outlook. But does this help them to influence the policy? Another example that I would like to give is Kenya, where incremental reforms have been used to address the gender inequality. 
and these were introduced in 1980. And then uh, that is, this is according to um, publications by Wanjala and Were uh, to 1998 and 1989. And lastly, in 2008 and 2009, when women were granted their own rights to report income and from sources such as interest. So what is the role of women here then? So when you look at the role of women uh, in tax policy, uh, it is also important to see is the gender equality issue a factor in this. So to address this, we need to look at who is involved in articulating this tax policy. And is this tax policy then relevant to women's development? So what can women do? So indeed their role is to participate in these uh, arms, the different arms of government that articulate this policy. There's the level of the executive, the, the, the ministries of finance, the ministries of um, justice and everybody else who is involved in designing these laws. So the women need to, uh, to have to be involved in this so that when these laws are articulated, there will be women, uh, law, law, there will be laws that favor, uh, that don't just favor women, but that are equitable. And like uh, the previous speaker said, and that the legislation will then come up with clauses that don't disadvantage women. And I think even the, the moderator did uh, indicate some of the elements that uh, can uh, disfavor women, like the issue uh, about VAT, PIT that, that she raised. The second is women can be involved in trade deals to determine if these deals are going to be deals that actually bring in the revenue that is required, if the treaties that are negotiated are treaties that are going to be of advantage and that are going to promote uh, revenue mobilization, et cetera. That is a key role that they need to play because if this revenue comes in, uh, then it will really go to the greater good. And then a few questions have to be asked. While the focus is, like, is on tax revenue optimization, is the policy that is developed putting into account the accountability aspect too necessary in ensuring the adhesion to the social contract between the state and its citizens given any consideration or has it become just a punchline? Is the budgeting process and other decisions uh, relating to uh, development drafted with the intention of addressing this gender equality? That is another role women can play, especially in the legislature and mm -hmm. also in an oversight role in terms uh, of tax policy. So in a nutshell, the bug doesn't stop with meeting just revenue targets. And this is what women, you know, the, uh, one of the role or clear roles uh, should be. But these resources should trigger a process of what they are spent on and whether mm -hmm. this addresses the gender inequality in society. Indeed, effective tax collection becomes meaningful when the proceeds directly and positively influence the improvement of women and, and uh, of, uh, improve, the improvement of all women inclusive. So let's see what the stats show. So part of the African Tax Outlook 2019, according to this uh, uh, outlook, it's a annual publication by ETA, we have approximately 50%, a ratio of one to 1 1.5, more men employed in tax administrations in Africa. This inequality extends to executive positions as women in executive positions can be estimated to an average of approximately 30%. So if this is the case, Will they be able to influence tax policy? So one of the, uh, the, the clear roles that we should be playing and that women in leadership should be playing is to ensure that there are enough women in this, uh, at these levels that can directly influence policy. Even in South Africa, where the overall revenue authority workforce is at 62% female, the share of females in top managing, management positions is only 12.5%. So it is clear that when we talk about simplicity, when we talk about uh, legislation that uh, ensures uh, enough mobilization of, uh, of resources, when we talk about putting in place laws that advantage uh, women, it is important to have people who are going to articulate this. And this is another role that women can play at the legislative level. When I, talk, when I talked about the judiciary, I think another role that women can play here is to ensure that they're in place in, the, uh, in, in this role so that uh, when there are tax disputes, the disputes will be, will, will be resolved equitably. And I think this is one of the challenges that most, uh, some of the investors have been um, dealing with, especially when they deal with, uh, uh, with rural women. And I think 
that is another role that we can play in terms of, um, you know, of, uh, of tax, uh, tax policy design. So these figures from the ATO point to the fact that participation of women in tax administration in Africa is really not adequate. And therefore this may impact the policy influence they have in terms of designing laws, in terms of devising processes, in terms of taking decisions that would advantage women and put them in places where they are able to provide useful impact uh, in terms of women development. So let's look at the, uh, very quickly look at the tax administration. Indeed, like the moderator said, they have demonstrated their excellence alongside their male counterparts. So women have made huge impact in tax administration in Africa, and this should be encouraged. They have led reforms such as enabling policies that improve tax administration in their role as finance ministers and commissioners general, examples of which are Uganda, Nigeria, Rwanda, etc. Now, we, the, an example was also uh, used, and actually this example comes from research done by ICTD that actually gave some very interesting uh, stats on, on the Uganda Revenue Authority, and I quote, it says, it is highly probable that overall performance is enhanced by uh, URA's mm -hmm. relatively high proportion of female employees due to women's slightly higher performance appraisal ratings, slightly lower rates of job turnover, and much lower rates of disciplinary action. So what is the role of women here? It is basically to promote the principles that were talked about by Jalia, the principle of simplicity, the principle of uh, clear communication to tax uh, payers and other people so that they understand and whether it's male or female, the women in tax need to ensure that those principles are adhered to by everybody. And they need to ensure that they actually um, enact all these uh, good lessons that we talk about. The issue of accountability, I spoke to that earlier, so I will not talk about it. Equitable systems, compliance, and the taxpayer education. Taxpayer education, I cannot overemphasize this. And we know that the larger group is really women, especially those in the informal sector. And here there's an, an example that really breaks my heart about the informal sector. And I know um, uh, this will be talked about later by Jalia, so I, I won't dwell on this. But the example I wanted to give is the one of the COVID situation. When relief packages were being given, most of these women are in the informal sector. They, do, they did not benefit. But if they are educated and told that being on the register will help you gain you know, some of these things, I think the women would have been blessed to benefit here. So the role of education, the role of simplicity, the role of clear legislation cannot be overemphasized. And then uh, before I conclude, I want to give you some stats that show a clear imbalance in women representation in, in revenue administrations, according to the work that ATAF has been doing. And this shows that one of the roles that we have to do is to promote more females, more uh, women to be involved in these executive positions, especially if they are going to be, to make any meaningful decision and any meaningful contribution. So in 2018, only 22% of uh, females were in executive positions as, of, as you know, in comparison to their male counterparts. In 2019, it was 24 against 76. In 2020, it was 21 uh, 21%. Now, if you look at the technical assistance that we deliver, we delivered technical assistance to 22 countries. Only four missions were done by females. In 2020, we carried out 17 trainings. Only 28% were females, were delivered by females against 82% male. And then in 2020, we had uh, trainees who joined our work. 34% were female against 66. How are, are they going to gain capacity? So one of the things that we need to do is to mainstream in tax policy and even as we make these decisions to ensure that we have enough females in the revenue administration to carry this forward. We have seen that they are good tax administrators. So the above clearly demonstrates the imbalance and needs to be addressed quickly through national policies that encourage uh, gender mainstreaming. And that is why the Africa Tax Administration will be launching its Africa Women in Tax Network next week on the 23rd from 11 to 12 p.m. And I'd like to welcome all of you to participate in it so that we can address this challenge. So as I conclude, Chair, indeed, only an effective gender diversity framework will improve women's participation in tax administration. And our role is clear. If we are going to 
put in place all these good things that we have talked about, if we are going to make it simpler to tax, if we are going to raise compliance, if we are going to put in place laws that are clear and attract investment, these barriers need to be, um, to be removed. With Akesha's effort to involve women in designing tax policy that leads to direct positive impact on livelihoods and women participating in tax administration, especially in leadership roles, there'll be more deliberate effort to address gender-based implicit and explicit biases in the tax structures and other issues affecting women in taxation. I thank you, Chair, and I'll be more than happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. I think what you have highlighted is that um, we have to be deliberate. Uh, policymakers have to be deliberate. Policymakers have to be to, to, to wear gender centric lenses in order for some of these imbalances that you have mentioned in tax administration, in the design of tax policy uh, to be addressed. Um, and moving away from the formal tax system, sometimes it's difficult to look at um, informal taxation issues. What are those issues that uh, that ultimately um, manifest as taxation, but are not within the formal tax system as we know it, and how do they impact women? Because these um, uh, many women-led businesses also have to, 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 they have some fiscal exposures which are not in the formal tax system, and these uh, impact how they, they, they do their businesses. Dr. Jalia Kangabe has done a lot of research on informal taxes and how they inform uh, they, they, they impact on women. What can policymakers do? What kind of gender-centric lenses can uh, policymakers do, Jalia, in order for these informal taxation uh, burdens to be uh, uh, addressed or reversed against women? Over to you, Jalia. So, so thank you. Thank you, Doris, for that introduction. And uh, before going to what can uh, policymakers do, I'll just go through some of the research that we've done and, and what we found. Now, normally when I think about gender in tax in Africa, I think about women like my mother who for a long time run this small restaurant uh, in, in a place called Wandega in, in Uganda. I think about Nalongo, which means a mother of twins, who was a lady in the market who would at 6 a.m. bring Matoke to my mother's business. I, I also think about Goretti, who is, is, uh, was a very no-nonsense, tough-speaking lady who ran a salon in Wandega where I used to do my hair uh, when I was a student at university and even after university. These are the women that drive the African economy. They, 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 are, what is, they are what is driving business, but then many times they're forgotten in the discussion. Now, some of them, as, as Julia has said, some of them will pay um, income taxes, uh, but they're normally small businesses, so they'll pay presumptive taxes. But a lot of what we see as their tax burden is normally found at the local government level, and so it's found in things that we have called formal and informal taxes. And if we could just go to the next slide, um, I'll address those. So if, if you think about some of the statistics, less than 5% of Africa's population pays personal income taxes. Now, obviously, that differs from one country to another. So um, while we find that both women and men in African countries pay very little in terms of personal income taxes, we find that they still pay a range of formal and informal taxes and user fees at the local government level. And the examples that I will give you in this research will, will show you uh, what that looks like. Similarly, we also find that at the household level, female-headed households, they, they spend a significant proportion of their income paying in formal taxes in order to access um, public goods, like you know whether it's schools or healthcare that would otherwise have been financed by taxes. And that's why we think it's important that when we're talking about taxes, we have a widespread definition of the fiscal burden that these payments have on both men and women. Next slide, please. So, so let's just see a few examples. That study that was conducted in, in Tanzania, uh, in markets, nine markets in Tanzania, where they found that there was really no 
gender distinction between men and women in terms of the actual market fees that they were paying. But then there was a huge disconnect between how much women paid when it came to toilet toilet fees compared to how much men paid and also that men they had an alternative if they didn't want to pay the toilet fees they just go and use you know the bushes or whatever it is but women ended up spending uh, spending up to 20 percent of their daily income on toilet taxes compared to 13 percent for men the other thing that has been found, particularly in market studies in markets in uh, Zimbabwe and also in Uganda, found that because market rates are normally flat and women um, trade in smaller items, those tax, those rates end up being more regressive, you know. So a flat rate, one person is earning like, let's say a hundred shillings, another person is earning 5,000 shillings because the men deal in bigger things. The women did end up paying more in of their income in taxes than the men did. But um, the research is not just about tax paying, it's also about tax collection. Right. So what do we see? And Mary has talked uh, uh, about about how what, what, what do we see as the influence of women in tax administration? So what do we see when women are involved at the local government level in tax collection as well? And in a study in Nigeria that looked at um, male tax collectors vis-a-vis -vis female tax collectors, it was found that majority of the cases that related to whether it was physical or verbal harassment or confiscation of goods or, or demands for sexual favors, the male tax collectors were more guilty for that than the female tax collectors. However, it was also found that female tax collectors were involved in bribe collection. So th this is not you know, one thing vis-a-vis -vis another, but we see that uh, when men and women, male and female traders were asked, you know, what would you prefer? And they did prefer that kind of mixed um, revenue collectors where you have both men and female tax collectors. Um, there have been some advantages. So it's not, it's uh, at the local government level, it's not always just been bad. So we find that women sometimes who are vulnerable, like women who are pregnant and elderly or widows, they receive preferential treatment. So we, we find cases where they've been exempted from paying taxes because of their circumstances. So it's not an either or kind of thing. Next slide, please. And then that, 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 they, there's also research in Sierra Leone and, and, and Julia referred to this that was done with one of our ICTD colleagues, Vanessa van den Bugard, which was looking at the kinds of payments that are made by male-headed households vis-a-vis female-headed households. And it was found that male-headed households spent a lot more of their income paying formal taxes, while female-headed households were paying a lot in informal taxes to access public goods and services. And what, what does this look like? It normally looked at things like um, contributing to community development projects, but also subsidizing fees for school teachers and things like um, subsidizing um, for healthcare providers. So really, um, demonstrating that if we look simply at taxation as things like income tax or VAT or um, um, income tax or VAT or all these central government tax systems or formal tax systems, then we're missing a lot of the actual fiscal burden that falls on many African women. Similarly, female-headed households in DRC, just like uh, the, the uh, research in Sierra Leone, were found to spend significantly more than male-headed households on the same um, public services like water and healthcare and sanitation. Next slide, please. So, so, so what does this mean in terms of, of research? So the studies that um, We've conducted at ICTD so far have been best in markets, but in a, in about four or five countries, and 
what we are finding in these studies is different. Different things come up. In Tanzania, the toilet taxes came up. In Nigeria, the, the issue of mixed uh, tax collectors came up. In Zimbabwe, the regressive aspect came up. So what we're finding is that the experiences are different in different countries, but also even within the same country, those experiences in different markets might be different. So we need more evidence on the impact of these small and informal taxes. And a lot of what has been done so far, for example, has been in markets, but we need a better understanding as well of women like who run small businesses, who run restaurants, who run small shops. How are they experiencing taxation? In addition to that, what explains these gender differences? Why do women end up paying, female-headed households in Sierra Leone, for example, end up paying a lot more in informal taxes than men? We need more research to understand what explains that. We also need to, uh, to understand the gender differences, and this has come up all the way from uh, the work that Joy talks about um, in international tax, but also what uh, Julia and Mary have talked about in terms of um, tax awareness and the complexity of tax systems. We need to understand at the local level what the gender differences of tax awareness are and what steps can be taken. Like Julia said, there's a lot that has been done in term by revenue authorities in terms of educating, but how do we ensure that we reach them? You know, how do we ensure that we reach these women? And how do we how do we break down this information in a way that is accessible to them? There's there's a lot that happening now, for example, on you know. Uh, 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 Zoom or Facebook or whatever, but most of these women that we're talking about, like Nalongo in the market and everything, they don't have access to this. They can't leave their market stalls. So she's, if, if you run a training somewhere, they're not going to come there and attend the training. So how do we reach them and educate them more about tax and make them more aware? And also, through what channels can women and men in the informal sector engage with the tax systems? You know what what role for example would associations of men and women have in in negotiating in helping with understanding tax issues but also in 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 trying to reduce the burden on them so we we also need to understand more how associations work uh are there some that are more effective than others and what can we learn from those so that is it from me thank you Thank you very much, Jalia. I think you've opened our eyes to um, some issues which we usually don't even think about. I mean, um, when we talk about the tax systems, uh, we, we frequently think about the direct taxes, maybe indirect taxes, tax policy design, and rarely do we even think about um, the day-to-day -day fiscal burdens that people go through uh, running their businesses and living their day-to-day -day lives. So I think, thank you very much for that. And I think we take away from, from, from you, what we take away from you is that the evidence is not yet sufficient or uh, we need to do to have much more research done on this area to see how, um, the, the, how the impact of informal taxes on female-headed businesses, maybe female-headed households, uh, how that fiscal burden can be reduced and how you know, that system at itself can be made um, more fair. So there are a few questions that are in uh, coming in from the audience, and I will ask um, Joy to explain how the international tax system um, can be improved, perhaps uh, especially in relation to taxation on the, of the digital economy. I think that was asked by Wycliffe uh, to make it more or more more fair or more or less 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 uh, harmful or, or, or less uh, difficult uh, for women. Over to you, Joy. Yeah, thank you for that question. I anticipated that someone would ask about uh, digital economy issues. And I mean, it is very relevant. Let me start by saying that because of course, it, you know, the digital economy is the next frontier for taxation. Uh, there are challenges in terms of nexus and trying to figure out how to tax uh, companies that have no physical presence in your country. Now, in terms of fairness and in terms of where we are right now, um, the current global solution is extremely complex. 
I, I think we can all <laughs> acknowledge and accept that it's extremely complex. Not only is it extremely complex, uh, there are elements that will probably be very difficult to implement for uh, African tax administrations where the technological capacities differ from where the Europeans or the United States might stand, uh, not just from the digitalization of administration itself, but also the cultural practices. You know, digitalization is not just about adopting systems, it's also about understanding systems and changing um, how people accept or deal with systems. So, you know, the process of digitalization must be sort of a two front uh, thing, right? Um, but, you know, in terms of how can we achieve or gain fair uh, systems or fair proposals, I think that's a difficult question to answer, to be quite honest. And, and, I, and my answer is really, well, it, it has yet to be seen, but it means that we have to study the proposals being made. What is the impact of the digital services tax that's been introduced? What's the impact of the VAT on the digital marketplace? It's difficult to answer this question, but we must understand the impact on uh, the disadvantages that women face whether these uh, proposals might frustrate them further. Uh, what's already becoming clear is that the global proposal might not produce significant results for developing countries. It may produce much more income for the resident jurisdictions than it will for market jurisdictions. And not just that, it requires a lot more systems to be in place at the administrative level. Uh, significant transparency, more use of exchange of information, country by country reporting, and more, more likely you will have to understand how source code algorithms and other factors to do with the digital economy work. And that's again a question of technical expertise. And I think my colleagues have absolutely brilliantly raised this and Mary has said this, that the technical expertise, the ability of women to participate in some of these technical areas it also needs to be questioned, right? So really it comes down to asking, what is the impact? Uh, can we study the impact? And are we willing to study the impact from an administrative perspective, from the proposals perspective? And indeed, I also should point out that any solutions that emerge right now are likely to change in the future. We still don't understand the digital economy fully. It's changing. New elements are arising, artificial intelligence, taxation of different elements of technology. So not just uh, dealing with the current proposals, but the future proposals. So for me, I will say, let's try to always have a good understanding of the impact it has on the disadvantages that women face and how we can eliminate those disadvantages. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, and I think uh, really uh, all these rules that are being made at the international policy um, debates or in the international policy arena are uh, really to, uh, uh, the, 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 the benefit that comes out of that is that we reduce all the, the, the revenue that is lost. The revenue that is lost, I, I agree the rules are complex, but they're also addressing complex issues. But ultimately the benefit is that hopefully we'll realize more revenue and because of more revenue, perhaps we can see uh, a lot more public spending directed towards uh, areas that uh, impact uh, social services, both for men and for women. I think for me, this is where, that's the takeaway I take from, from um, that whole angle. Um, Mary has talked about uh, tax education, being deliberate about tax education. Uh, Julia has also talked about uh, women not being um, very, very knowledgeable about their responsibilities and yet there is a move to, to formalize. And I think that creates an intersection between the requirement to formalize the economy, but it also brings, up, brings about a, a burden, a high compliance burden for women. And this is some of the issues that we would like to talk about. Uh, Julia, what can you say about that intersection? I, I call it a dilemma, the formalization dilemma it's important for them to formalize because then they can grow, but it also creates a compliance burden on them, which because of the way perhaps the little education they have, the exposure is not as, as great, they are not able to afford uh, the intermediaries, tax intermediaries, they, the burden is a bit high. What can you say about this intersection, Julia? And perhaps give, give us your last question. <laughs> I think it's, you know, this is a really hard question because as you said, it's, uh, there are so many things going on when we think about the informal sector that it's really hard uh, to really um, say what, what is it that sh we should be doing. But I think at least we know a couple of things. 
And um, one of them is related to what uh, Jalia said, and uh, she might want to uh, pick up on that. Um, you know, we normally think that the informal sector is this entity that doesn't pay any tax. And I think, and that is wrong. I mean, what uh, Jalia showed us is that is definitely not the case. And, and, and informal taxes generate resources where the formal tax system uh, cannot arrive. And it's important for those of us who are concerned or who are particularly focused on the uh, formal tax system to realize that people who are outside the formal tax net do, do still experience payments that are tax-like. Um, so I think the narrative we should expand the tax base because people outside of the tax net aren't paying any taxes is just wrong uh, in, 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 in those contexts. Um, but then, yeah, there is the whole issue of, uh, you know, once you bring people in, uh, you know, what does that mean in terms of tax revenue, which is what tax administrators are often uh, is, you know, the primary concern is, is, you know, how much tax revenue comes in and it's not maybe uh, the only one, it shouldn't be the only one, but it's definitely, it's definitely there and formalizing all those informal firms doesn't necessarily make a big difference. So is that, is that a good use of resources? And on that, I mean, it seems to me like tackling all the other forms of informality is really uh, what matters here, especially if we're looking to increase revenue. And I mean, in normal times, I would say the most important thing for the tax system is to uh, think about fairness. And I, and I still think that is true, but especially in these times with the pandemic and recovery where you know, revenue needs are going to be huge, we need to think about what it, where is it that tax administrators should focus their energy. And, and I think the answer is not formalizing the informal sector in the traditional sense. The answer is uh, going to uh, sort of informal incomes, which are not properly taxed. And these are often from wealthy individuals. So here I'm not talking about taxing these people more or introducing new taxes. It's just about, you know, um, applying the laws that are already there, that are so poorly administered that oftentimes those wealthy individuals don't, don't end up paying like everybody else. So, I mean, on this, I, I, I also want to invite Jalia to talk about it because I know she did some work, so I don't want to speak for the work that she has done in, in Uganda and Rwanda. Thank you. Before Jalia comes in, I would like to maybe just take it to Mary on the other side, that um, are you able to, to say positively that if more women are uh, involved or represented, represented at the legislative level, in the judicial level, that we are able to see more gender responsive or gender transformation tax policies being enacted. Mary, what do you think? Thank you so much. And um, well, in all certainty, uh, I think there is an issue of education that we talked about. So I think even these parliamentarians and the people in these judicial systems need to understand the intricacies of taxation they need to understand what laws are in place and how these are going to support, uh, you know, this, uh, especially the low income bracket uh, people. And so uh, I can't say that having more members will just automatically cause this. The members need to understand, they need to understand the nitty gritty about the laws they are enacting. The, the members of the, uh, and that is why for a long time now, we've been trying to talk to parliamentarians. We've been trying to ex explain to them some of these intricacies. There's what Joy was talking about, the, uh, you know, the global debate that's, going, uh, that's uh, on uh, taxing the digital economy. But mm -hmm. I don't want to go into that complexity. I want to talk about much simpler things, like what was discussed about the informal sector, what was discussed about VAT. They need to understand, for instance, I'll give an example of the VAT especially for women. If you look at women, like you said, even in your opening remarks, women tend to purchase more uh, stuff that is related to education, that is related to health, that is related to that kind of thing. So if they are doing that, it means they are paying more as opposed you know, to the other sector. So the, 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 the parliamentarian needs to understand that there is a direct correlation with that. The parliamentarian needs to understand that if they put in place a threshold that is extremely low, it's going to cause that those people will be included in the bracket and it will be difficult for them to administer that. So they need to understand that because they are not registered, they will not be able to claim back their input tax. So it means whatever they pay, they lose. It goes for good. So that is the kind of thing. So I think, yes, um, if they are uh, 
educated about it, and if they understand about it, they will be able to support those roles. And well, there are a couple of examples where that has happened, where um, a couple of policies have been put in place, for instance, and there are also other factors that are not tax related. I know for sure that some parliamentarians have fought for women to have more time, especially women who are working women, to have more time, especially when, like, when they go for, for their maternity leave. But it was because they were educated. So likewise, even in tax, that is, that is what happens. Now, with regard to the judiciary, it's even more complicated because when these tax issues go to courts, do the judges understand the tax systems in the, to, to a level where they can then uh, give their, their judgment in, in all honesty? These are some of the things that we have to look at. But yes, the women need to be there, but we also need to understand them. So I think the two need to go together. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So in short, what you're saying, it's not just about numbers. It's not just about putting people in to, to fill the seats, but these people need to have the lenses. They need to have these perspectives. They need to have this centricism uh, to gender issues, especially on enhancing or removing the barriers. Let me say removing the barriers that right. exist. And, 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 and this gender centricism can also extend to the men in, in these places. So um, it's not just about the numbers. Jalia. What can we do to reduce the, the dilemma, call it the formalization dilemma, and, uh, and whatever burden that it creates for women-led businesses? Um, thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, a number of thoughts here, which are a bit all over the place, uh, depending on when you're all talking. And, and, and so in terms of formalization, it's, it's again, like, Julia was saying, my struggle with it is it's it's not a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing, but just like we said, taxation is not going to be the solution to everything. And so when talking to these women about formalizing their businesses, we, we, we've been doing some study in, in Uganda recently, and they say, oh, they tell us, you know, they tell us to register quickly, quickly. And before we know it, they're sending us bills, they're taxing us, they're, you know? So, so it is still a burden, you know? So yes, we're registering. And then we're having cases where you register and pay once, like Julia was showing in Rwanda, and then you don't pay again, sometimes because you shouldn't have been registered in the first place. So in terms of formalization, the question then is, how is it working for them? We've seen cases where, for example, the, there have been arguments in law and development where you say formalize uh, land, but then we saw that formalization of land did not necessarily mean that women could get more credit. So how are we addressing all these other things that come with formalization before we rush? And then in terms of when we're talking about the informal sector, if we are saying that, uh, uh, that you know, there's a large informal sector, but what exactly do we mean by that? Because the research that we've done on high net worth individuals in Rwanda, for example, shows that within the formal sector, there's also a large informal sector, right? So people who are registered, whether as lawyers or doctors or whatever, but they're not paying their taxes. This, if we're talking about equity, and you're finding less women there, right? So if we're talking about equitable tax systems and we're talking about informality, what other kinds of informality are we not addressing? Meanwhile, normally when we bring the argument of these informal taxes that, that women at the local level pay, uh, mainstream is quick to dismiss them and say oh no 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 those are not taxes don't call them taxes they're fees they're you know and and you know there's a kind of privilege attached to that understanding of taxation a privilege that really denies the lived experiences of these women right so bef before we dismiss them let's find a solution to them thank you Thank you very, very, very much. And I think we're at the point uh, when we will run the poll again. We have listened to the presentations. We have listened to the various perspectives. We have a bit more, uh, call it understanding and knowledge of the issues that have been talked about. We will run the poll again and ask you, having listened to the presentations and the discussions, what do you think about African systems? Are African systems biased against women? Uh, do you agree now or if you disagreed before? Do you disagree now if you agreed before? Are you still not sure? If you are not sure, just run the poll, put in your responses, and we will see if 
the discussions that um, have have changed your perspectives. And soon we'll get to see the results and compare them uh, with what we had before. Um, Julia wanted to say something quickly. I thought I would pick up on something while we wait for the results of uh, the poll, because uh, there was a question uh, about, uh, you know, women in parliament, and there was also an ongoing discussion in the chat about women in tax administration. And, uh, you know, whether having that percentage of women really helps to achieve better outcomes. And I think what Mary said before is really important. I just wanted to reiterate it. So having 60% of women doesn't mean that those women are actually the ones taking uh, decisions. And the same goes for uh, parliamentarians. So I think it really matters who is it that takes decision, who dominates decision making, and what kind of pressures are women under when they participate in those discussions. And focusing on the percentage of women, I mean, of course, it's important to improve women participation. But that in itself is really not the end goal and is not necessarily going to change much. Uh, just like Jalia said, you know, formalizing land ownership for women is not necessarily going to solve the underlying issues. So I think we should go beyond those percentages and those uh, very specific targets and, and, and try to address the broader uh, issues. So I see the poll results are in, so let me uh, stop there. Thank you very much. The poll results are in, um, haven't changed much. Um, and I think this is because many have probably realized that the, the biases are not explicit biases. They are not explicit in the way the laws are made or where the policies are made, but they're perhaps implicit, embedded in the way the policies and laws are implemented. So perhaps we, these are some of the things that we need to be mindful about when talking about tax policy, talking about tax uh, administration, and, and, and generally making laws and policies um, in the area of taxation, but also in the area of informal taxation. It's been an interesting conversation. I want to thank all the panelists that have taken part and, and shared your knowledge. I want to thank all the attendees. Thank you for making time and for attending the webinar. You've made it uh, an interesting session for all of us. As we sign off, I think we go away with things to think about. How can the international tax policy making process be made more inclusive or perhaps even be made more responsive to the specific needs of African economies? What kind of other kinds of informality are we not addressing? Yeah, there, there's a, the issue that maybe toilet tax is not a tax, but it is a fiscal burden. So what other kinds of informality are we not addressing? What policy tools other than tax can be adopted to address the barriers uh, that women face as they go about uh, doing their business, living their lives, and generally um, uh, uh, going on about life? What can policymakers do to encourage the involvement of women at higher levels in tax administrations, in tax policy units, but also in technical assistance and capacity building missions? What what can we do? How deliberate can we be? How much more deliberate can we be about increasing the numbers at that level? And of course, uh, finally, there is need for more research in the area of informal taxation. There is not enough research for us to come to conclusions. So what deliberate actions can we do to encourage research in this area? It's been an interesting discussion. Thank you all very much. And I would like to say thank you and goodbye.